It's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jun uh, Liu, who is uh, the University of uh, Central, Cal Central Florida, rather, Pegasus professor and uh, Lockheed Martin St. Laurent professor. He's a very accomplished guy. Uh, he's got 12 U.S. patents. He's more than 280 journal papers and more than 230 uh, papers at uh, international conferences. In fact, that's where I originally met him, was at a, uh, the I, uh, ICCE Taiwan, I believe it was. And uh, he's also been involved in many uh, uh, granted research projects funded both by industry as well as uh, the government. Um, he's uh, received 10 different awards on excellence in teaching and research from the University of Central Florida. Um, he's a member of a lot of organizations. Um, uh, it's a huge list of them. He also has been very active in the uh, Electron Devices Society. He was vice president of regions and chapters. He was their treasurer. He was the finance committee chair and member of their board of governors and also member of their educational activities committee. So it's a great pleasure to have him come, come and talk to us about a topic that actually is very important in consumer electronics. And I don't think we've dealt with it as much as we ought to, and that is dealing with uh, uh, the issues around uh, the actual functioning of the devices, uh, particularly the electrostatic discharge and uh, preventing devices from failing. So he's going to talk to us today about uh, electrostatic discharge protection of low voltage consumer challenges, or consumer electronics. He's going to talk about the challenges and solutions. So with that, Dr. Liu. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Tom for the introduction. Uh, we met in uh, Taiwan. How long ago was? Uh, Last year. Yeah, it was uh, less than a year, I think, right? So, uh, and then uh, he kind of liked my presentation, so sent me an invitation to come here. Uh, so, um, this morning I would like to give you uh, a uh, introduction about a very important subject, uh, which is electrostatic discharge protection. Um, we design protection for all kinds of consumer electronics, uh, but because of the time limitation, I can only cover low voltage uh, application today. Uh, there's also a bunch of uh, high voltage applications like uh, automotive electronics, uh, power management, management chip, uh, flat panel display. Uh, those are on the high voltage side, but I would not be able to to cover that. For the, vo uh, for the low voltage of creation, mostly I'll be talking about the uh, wireless communication electronics, like the cell phones and uh, etc. Uh, by the way, the work um, uh, was, uh, was done by my uh, ESD group at the University of Central Florida and the ESD group at the analog devices in, uh, in Boston. Okay, so this is the outline. First, I'll give a brief introduction about ESD, and then I will talk about the ESD protection design challenges and solution in low voltage CMOS technology. And I, then I will get, uh, uh, get into the subject of uh, ESD protection for the emerging FinFET uh, technology, uh, which has been used in the advanced uh, wireless communication chips. And finally, I'll give you some um, uh, industry trends and, uh, and the summary. Okay, uh, so before I get into the details, I'd like to just give you a broad picture about the critical areas related to uh, consumer electronics. Now you can see, uh, uh, of course, the materials, technologies, that's very important. Uh, design, modeling, simulation, processing, and finally, uh, the issue of uh, reliability. Under the reliability, there are two different uh, type of reliability, the edging reliability and the single event uh, reliability. Uh, for the silicon uh, technology, uh, which has been used for most of the consumer electronics, the good news is that the, uh, the edging reliability has been uh, very good. Uh, you should know that a typical silicon chip uh, has a lifetime of more than 10 years and how, how often we change our electronic gadgets. You know, less than five years, right? So, so that is uh, more than sufficient. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, the single event reliability has become a big issue uh, for the consumer electronics. And for that, the ESD is the most prominent single event as about 35% of chip failure can be attributed to such an incident. So that's why uh, ESD has been a very important uh, subject for the uh, semiconductor industry. 
And um, you know, we have many uh, consumer electronics, and uh, and we use many chips. And uh, about 95% of chip use in these uh, systems uh, require ESD protection. And the modern and future technology call for very complex and customized uh, ESD protection solutions uh, that have small footprint, high robustness, low loading effect, high latch up immunity, and the low cost. So all these are the requirements for uh, the modern and the future um, ESD protection solutions. And that becomes uh, very difficult and uh, challenging to, uh, to, uh, to develop. And uh, this, this figure on the left uh, represents the cost of ESD uh, versus the CMOS uh, technology. So you can see that the cost is, is going up when the, uh, the CMOS technology is, uh, is advancing. And on, on the right hand side, you see this green area. Uh, that represent the, uh, the ESD design window that must be implemented uh, for any specific uh, technology. And unfortunately, uh, this window will become smaller and smaller uh, when the technology is, uh, is advancing. So I always like to mention that the ESD is a possible spoiler to the development of the next generation consumer electronics. So uh, what's the ESD? Well, this photo should give you a very, very good idea. Uh, so what happens is that your body can have charge. Yeah? And then uh, when you touch a metal, a metal is what we call the ground. The ground can accept the charge from your body. And then you need the last component before an ESD event can happen. That is, you need a conductive pass between the source and the ground. Uh, in this case, the conductive pass is the, is the skin of your body. Uh, so any ESD event must have these three components, the source, the ground, and the pass. Uh, now, of course, how much charge you have on, on your body uh, can be measured by the voltage. Uh, for example, if you have uh, a, a voltage of 1,500 volts, and uh, your body's skin resistance is typically about 1,500 ohm. So this process can generate a maximum current of 1M. Now, by the way, 1M is a very high current. Uh, fortunately, uh, our body is very sturdy, and nobody gets killed by this process. Otherwise, this will become a huge problem for the, uh, for the society. Uh, but uh, if, if this were a chip, that's a different story, because a chip is much, much uh, more uh, fragile. So when you have this type of year event, the, uh, the chip can get uh, damaged. OK, there are different uh, ESD events that can cause damages to a microchip. Uh, the most well-known one is called the human body model. Uh, in this case, uh, a human uh, a person can have charge. And so when you touch a chip, uh, the charge goes from your fingertip to the chip to the ground. And there are also other models. But today, I will just focus on the, uh, uh, the human body model. OK, so now let me uh, talk about how we can design ESD protection for a, uh, for a system. When I say a system, like a, a cell phone, okay, that's a system. Uh, typically, we would have two uh, ESD protection uh, schemes. The first one is called off-chip. The second one is called on-chip. So, so if you have a PCB like this uh, with many chips, so what you do is um, uh, you put an uh, off-chip uh, ESD protection chip, which is called TVS. And then you connect the TVS to, the, uh, to one of the connectors of the, um, of the, uh, of the PCB. And then when there's an ESD event, uh, this TVS will turn on. And some of the ESD energies will be, uh, will be uh, taken care of by this uh, off-chip uh, ESD protection. And then uh, the rest of the ESD would go to uh, all the chips on the, on the PCB, and then you will need to have uh, the on-chip ESD protection to take care of the, uh, the ESD stress. Uh, I'd like to mention that the uh, on-chip ESD is a must-have due to the handling and the assembly at the component level, right? Because when you are shipping uh, chips, uh, you must have on-chip protection because the off-chip protection cannot do anything for you. Uh, and the off-chip, which is TVS, is optional and is often added 
to enhance the ESG to robustness at the system level. Uh, for example, uh, your cell phone typically has about 30 to 40 TVS, um, in addition to the, uh, the on-chip ESD protection. Now, of course, if you do a very good job on your on-chip protections, you don't need off-chip. That's why I say it's, it's optional. But uh, I don't think anybody in the industry can say that, okay, I can design such a good ESD, on-chip ESD protection, therefore I can neglect the off-chip. I haven't seen anybody who can say that. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, focus on the on-chip uh, ESD protection. So typically you have, a, uh, you have a core circuit and then you have to put uh, these devices or circuits uh, between the pins uh, for the purpose of ESD protection. So there are two objectives. Uh, the first one, these protection devices will shun ESD current away from the core circuit. The second, uh, is that these devices will turn on and they will clamp the I.O. and the power pins voltages to a safe level. For example, huh? uh, let's say if you have an ESD to this pin, a thousand volts, and you can see that this pin is connected to the gate oxide of the MOSFET, right? If you have no ESD protection, then this a thousand volt can easily damage the gate oxide of the MOSFET. Therefore, you can have core circuit uh, damages, which is not allowed. With the ESD protection, uh, we can make sure that the uh, we can make sure that the voltage that is subjected to ESD uh, can be maintained at a safe uh, level. Okay, uh, there are some details about the design uh, requirements. Uh, I will just go through them very quickly. Uh, first of all, the protection devices must be in the off. Second, the protection devices must be turned on very quickly when there's an ESD event. Typically, the speed of the turn on should be on the order of nanosecond because ESD is a, is a very fast event. Uh, the protection devices must not be damaged by the ESD stress because they are used to protect the core circuit. Uh, so, so this device themselves should be able to withstand the ESD stress. Uh, the protection devices must return to the off state after the ESD event has passed. Otherwise, the devices are in the prohibited latch up state. So latch up also is a very important consideration for uh, the ESD uh, design. Finally, the protection devices must be as small as possible to save the, uh, the chip size. Uh, what are the devices we typically use to uh, to implement uh, ESD protection uh, solutions. Uh, typically, we use these three devices. Uh, the left, the one on the left is called a silicon control rectifier. Uh, basically, it's a bipolar device. Uh, it has a PMP uh, in coupling with MPN. So it has two bipolar devices. Uh, the one in the middle is an is a MOS with the gate grounded. So it's called a grounded gate GG MOS. And for some simple ESD protection designs, uh, we use uh, dials. These are the IV curves of the three devices I have just mentioned. Uh, now, if you look at a dial like this, you can see the dial can turn on at 0.7 volt in the forward direction, and it can also turn on uh, at the, uh, at the uh, breakdown region when it's subjected to the reverse direction. The SCR and the ground gate mass have a unique behavior like we call uh, snapback. So you can see that they would turn on at a relatively high voltage and then it would go to a small voltage stay and then, and then this is the region where they are turned on and they are uh, discharging the, uh, the ESD current. The, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's an ESD design window uh, we must follow when we do uh, the uh, ESD design put, uh, protections. Uh, the IV curve of ESD protection device must be located in the ESD design window, okay? The, uh, the lower bound of the, of, of the design window is the pin op operating voltage, and the upper bound is the voltage that can cause pin failure. Uh, for a typical I.O. pin of RFICs, uh, the lower bound will be about two volts, which is the pin operating voltage. Uh, the upper bound is about four or five volts, 
which is the breakdown voltage of the gate oxide. Okay. So for a typical RFIC, the design window will be about two to four or five volts. Uh, if the ESD design violates the lower bound, then ESD force triggering latch up can occur. And if ESD violates the upper bound, then the core circuit damage can take place. So this is the, the overall uh, picture of the uh, protection. Uh, with the, uh, you can use different devices uh, between the pins. Uh, and then in the case where you have, you have a multiple domain circuit, that means you have, on a chip, you have more than one circuit with different uh, power supplies. Like this one, you have two different circuits with two different power supplies, one with VDD, the other one's VDD prime. Then you would have to add this graded area devices so that uh, you can provide an effective uh, ESD protection. Uh, this dials right here will be used to connect the two different domains uh, when there's an ESD event. Okay, uh, there's an important equipment we, uh, we frequently use to characterize uh, ESD uh, protection design, and which is called the uh, Transmission Line Pulsing Tester, TLP. So uh, basically a TLP has a transmission line. Uh, when you charge the tr transmission line, uh, it would have charge on the line, and then you, you discharge the line, and then when you do the discharge, you would generate a, a, a pulse. And the pulse would be very similar to the real ESD pulse. So you put a pulse into the device on the test. So this is one of the uh, ESD protection devices. And then you will see uh, two waveforms, the voltage versus time waveform and uh, vo uh, the current versus time waveform. And then you take the, the section in the middle, you go up here, that will give you one data point on the IV plot. And then you keep on generate different pulses, and then you get many data points. And then when you link all the points, that will give you the IV curve of the device subject to the ESD uh, stress. So let me give you an example. Uh, so this is a, it's a TLP uh, tester. Uh, so you can see that for this particular device that we have tested, uh, this is called the, the trigger point, this is called the, the holding point, and this is called the failure point. So that's when the device uh, has failed because of the, the ESD stress. And this failure point is called IT2. So the failure point, uh, the failure current IT2 is the indicator of the device ESD robustness. And this current depends on the holding voltage right here, the holding voltage. Uh, depends on the type of device and also depends on the device size. Uh, naturally, the larger the, the device, uh, the higher the, uh, the failure current and therefore the, 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 the higher the, uh, the ESD robustness. Okay, so for this particular device, the uh, IT2, the current, failure current was about 0.9 amp. So if you multiply 0.9 amp to the uh, human body resistance of 1500 ohm, you get a voltage of 1,350 volt. So that is the, the maximum protection level of this particular device. And also the smallest ESD design window for this device is five to 11 volts. And these are the typical ESD classifications for the different uh, uh, models. If you look at the human body models, there are seven classifications, and the one in the bow face uh, is the typical ESD protection level found in uh, commercial microchips. Okay, now we can go to the, um, with that background, we can go to the ESD protection design challenges and solutions in low voltage CMOS technology. Uh, a very widely used low voltage consumer electronic is the, is the cell phone. So this is the front end of the cell phone and all this uh, RFIC can be easily damaged if ESD protection structures are not put in place. Uh, the typical ESD design window for all these circuits is about 
1.5 to 4 votes. So we need to remember this requirement. So when we design ESD protection for this circuit, uh, the ESD design window is 1.5 to 4 volts. Okay, uh, one of the way to design the, the protection is to use dials. Okay, so now uh, with the design window of 1.5 to 4 volts, we will need to use a stack of at least two dials in series uh, for the I.O. protection. And here uh, we have three different choices. You can have two STI bound dials, you can have two poly bound dials, and you can have one STI and one poly bound dials. And then if you look at the, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the robustness, uh, all three have similar robustness because if you look at the, the failure currents, the three choices have similar uh, failure currents. And then if you look at the capacitance of the three combinations, you will find that the, uh, the STI bound has the lowest capacitance, which is good, because the, the lower the capacitance, the lower the, uh, the loading effect, and therefore the less uh, the degradation of the, of the core circuit functionality. And the, uh, the worst one is the uh, combination of STI and the party bound dial. So if you want to use a dial, then this is the, <coughs> the typical schematic. So here, uh, again, you have to use two dials for each pin. And then uh, the circuit is a uh, 5 gigahertz low noise amplifier in uh, 90 nano CMOS technologies. And we have found that the, uh, without the ESD protection, the circuit will damage will be damaged at 50 volt human body model. So you have to optimize the, the, the size of the dial uh, because if the, the dial of the size is too large, then you would get a large capacitance and that can cause a very large degradation to the RF functionality. So we have optimized the size of the dial and uh, it was about uh, 65 times 10 micron square. Unfortunately, with that optimization, you still have a fairly large capacitance, about 100 federal farad. And so if you look at the, uh, the RF performance of the LNA, uh, the dash line is without the ESD protection, and the solid line is with ESD protection. So now you can see that uh, because of the ESD protection, the, uh, the RF uh, performance has been degraded quite significantly. If you look at the noise figure, the noise figure has been increased by about 20% because of the ESD protection structure. So naturally, uh, you want to find a device that has uh, low capacitance so that you have relatively small uh, RF degradation. Uh, so we have compared many different devices, the MOS, the PMOS, the SCR, the diode. So you can see that uh, the worst devices are the MOS and the PMOS. So therefore, uh, if you want to design a very high performance ESC protection for RF ICs, uh, you should not. You should not use MOS and the CMOS, PMOS. Uh, the dial is okay in the middle, but the best device is SCR right here. So therefore, uh, SCR is a, is a very attractive uh, device for uh, for the ESD uh, protection of RFIC. Unfortunately, uh, SCR has a has a drawback. So if you look at the this is the this is the cross section of an SCR, and then this is the IV curve of SCR. Remember, the window we talk about is about two to four volts, right? The ESD design window. Now you can see that if you use an SCR, clearly you will violate, you will violate the upper bound window of the ESD design, which is not allowed. Even though the SCR has a such attractive feature for, for the low voltage IC. So therefore, uh, if you really like to use SCR, you have to find a way to reduce the trigger voltage to a very low uh, uh, value. So there are several ways to do that. The first way uh, is right here. You can add uh, M plus regions uh, to the SCR. And now you can see by adding this M plus regions, uh, your voltage, trigger voltage, has been reduced to about six volts from about 15 volts. 
Uh, another way to do that, which was, uh, which was uh, introduced by my group a while ago, was to uh, introduce two additional regions. One is called NESD, the other one is called the PESD. And because of these uh, two additional regions, uh, the trigger voltage can also be reduced. So you can see from here, this is the typical ESD uh, SCR with a trigger voltage of 14 volt. Now with the, with the new uh, regions, uh, the trigger voltage has been reduced to 7 volts. Uh, you can also combine uh, a chain of dial with ESD, uh, with SCR. So this is SCR and this, there's a chain of dials. So with that, you can also try to reduce the, uh, the trigger voltage. So you can see that here, the trigger voltage has been reduced to about one, two, four volts, depending on how many dials you have on the, uh, on the dial chain. But this approach may be a little bit uh, complex sometimes because uh, the way you place the dials on, on, the, on the chip, so there are four different placements I have shown here, uh, can affect the uh, performance of the, uh, of the ESD potential. So you can see here, uh, even though each one has four dials, they're supposed to have the same uh, ESD performance, but, but in, uh, in reality, they do not have the same performance. Uh, so therefore, the, uh, the layout design, the routing of the metals, uh, all becomes uh, an issue for the, uh, for the, for the, for the protection. Uh, this is something we have de uh, developed recently. This is an, an SCR, but we have added a, a PMOS in the middle. Uh, so this is called a PMOS trigger uh, SCR. And you can see that with this device, uh, the window has been reduced to about two to three volts, comparing to the typical window of 16 volts. So with this type of device, it is very uh, suitable for the, uh, for the low voltage IC protection. Can give that. Okay, uh, sometimes uh, your circuit can have very high frequency uh, operation, uh, like uh, more than 10 gigahertz. Uh, in that case, the, uh, the approach I have just mentioned, by attaching a device directly to the pin, that approach would not work anymore. So in this case, what you have to, what you have to do is, is that you have to find a way to isolate the ESD protection device from the main circuit so that the, uh, so that the, uh, uh, the capacitance of the ESD protection device would not be affecting the, uh, affecting the, uh, the core circuit uh, at high frequency operation. So how do you do that? How do you isolate the ESD protection device from the core circuit? Well, if you look at the inductor and the capacitor, the impedance of these two versus the frequency, you can see that one is going up, the other one is going down. So if you make a parallel combination of the inductor and the capacitor, then theoretically, again, it's, a ther it's in theory, huh? theoretically, uh, at low voltages, at low frequencies, uh, this network will give you uh, a very small impedance, so it'll be like a short circuit. Uh, at very high frequencies, this network will give you uh, a, a very high frequencies like an like a open circuit. Now, uh, you, should, you should know that the ESD uh, signal is a low frequency signal. So therefore, when there's an ESD, uh, this network will become a short circuit, so the, the pin will be protected by the ESD protection uh, structure. At very high frequency, that's when there's no ESD, there's no ESD. then the, uh, the network would become an open circuit, and that would isolate the ESD protection structure from the, uh, from the core circuit. So in theory, that's a very good idea. Uh, and there are many different, uh, uh, different proposals. Okay? Uh, for example, like this one, you can see that the two dials are the ESD protection devices. Now you have added the parallel of an inductor and capacitor between the pin and the dial. And I, as I said, this network is used to isolate the, uh, the dial from the core circuit uh, during the high frequency operation. Uh, when there's an ESD event, this will become a short circuit, and then uh, the dial will turn on and uh, will do the job for you. 
Okay. And there are many different versions. Sometimes people just use an inductor. Uh, Sometimes they use an inductor in series as a capacitor. But it's all the same concept. <laughs> And then uh, they also, some people also use a uh, transformer uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, ESD protection purpose. Okay, so let me give you a few examples that have been done. Uh, this is a, uh, a using, uh, this is a design using a di uh, inductor in parallel with a capacitor. So you can see this box right here that represents the, the, the RF pin ESD protection structure. Uh, so box A is ESD protection based on inductor, uh, which acts like an open circuit at the operating, operating frequency and a low pass filter for ESD signal. Uh, the, uh, for example, a three nano Henry inductor will give you a voltage drop of 3.8 volt. So, uh, so the resistance of the inductor also an issue, right? Because when there's an ESD event, this becomes a short circuit, uh, then there's a voltage build up on the inductor, and then you can see that this pin is connected to the gate oxide of the, of the LNA, LNA. And if the voltage build up is too large, then this gate oxide will be damaged. So how do you prevent that? Then you can see you need a box B right here. What's the purpose of box B? If you look at D1 and D2, D1 would take 0.7 volt to turn on, right? So b then I, if I put two in series, that means when the voltage is more than 1.4 volt on the pin, then this two dial will turn on. If this two dials turn on, then this pin would, the maximum voltage on the pin will be maintained at 1.4 volt. So that's the purpose of, of box B. So with all that, uh, you can see that the noise figure is again, the degradation is again about 20 20%. And there's an uh, example of using a distributed network like this. So basically, you use a distributed uh, dials uh, with uh, some resistance so that you can try to match the, the, uh, the input impedance of the, of the I.O., which is, which is 50 volts, uh, which is 50 ohm. And then this is a uh, new design we have developed recently that was based on uh, capacitors. You can see here. So the concept is the following. Uh, we designed the capacitor so that at the frequency operation, which is 24 gigahertz, uh, this capacitor is like a short circuit. So you can see these two dials are ESD protection devices. right? So at 24 volts, one end of the dial is short. The other end of the dial is also short. So therefore, the capacitance of the dial will have, will have no effect to the, to the core circuit. Uh, when there's an ESD event, the capacitor become open, and then the two dial will, will turn on and will conduct the current. And then if you look at the, uh, the noise figure of the, of the new design, which is in black, and in the tra traditional design, you can see that the, uh, the degradation of the noise figure becomes much less. Okay, maybe another 10 minutes or so, I would like to just introduce the, uh, the challenges of ESD in uh, FinFAC technology. <laughs> well, there are, there are different culprits for the ESD uh, uh, damages in different, uh, different technologies. So you can see that the uh, from two micron technology node all the way to 14 uh, nanometer the, uh, the main culprit for the ESD uh, damages are, are somewhat different. For example, uh, if you look at two micron, then the ESD was mostly damaged because of the, the increased junction power dissipation. When you go to the fin fat, uh, it was the, uh, the local self heating of the, of the fins. And the conclusion is that the ESD robustness is getting uh, worse, which is, which is uh, bad news. So there are two different FinFAC architectures, uh, the SOI and the bulk. So you can see here, this is the uh, SOI FinFAC. On the right-hand side is the bulk. And uh, the 45 nanometer FinFAC technology was first commercialized uh, in uh, 2013. And the 10 nanometer FinFAC technology will be used uh, uh, early this year. 
for, for uh, some uh, wireless communication chips. Okay, so now if we want to design uh, ESD protection solution in the FinFact technologies, uh, you have different choices. You can use the, uh, the, the dials, and the dials have, there are two, type, two types of dials, the gated dials and the STR dials. So if you compare the gated dials and the STR dials in FinFact, and then you look at IT2, which is the robustness, uh, you can see that the, uh, the gated dial is, uh, is a little bit better, right, because the gated dial is the blue, the gated dial is a little bit better than the, uh, the STR dials, so, which, is, which is good. And if you want to use the SCR uh, in the FinFact technology, then, uh, then you have two choices. Uh, the one on the top is called the LVTSCR, uh, which will give you about 4,000 volt uh, HBM, human body voltage protection. You can also use uh, MRS, uh, and then if you look at MRS, there are different uh, performance indicators. But if you look at this one, uh, this one has two curves, one with the strength technology, the other one with no strength. As you know, when you use FinFact, you can choose strength or you can choose uh, no strength. Right? Uh, as far as the ESD protection is concerned, the strength is better. Why? Because if you look at the strength technology, uh, this is the failure point, so it will give you a failure current of about 100 milliamp. Uh, without the strength, the, uh, the failure current will be about 80 milliamp. So if you use the strength technology, the robustness can be increased by about 20%. So that's what we recommend to the, to the customers. If you have to uh, do the ESD protection design in FinVec technologies, uh, you should try to use the strength uh, technology. Unfortunately, even with the strength technology, you can see that uh, 100 milliamp uh, translates to about 150 volt human body model. Uh, currently in the market, uh, the customers are typically requiring a voltage of at least 500 volts. So this 150 volt becomes a huge problem for the, uh, for the chip suppliers uh, because it's too low. And uh, there's also a difference between the bulk FinFET and the SOI FinFET. Uh, so the bulk is in the, in the solid circles. The bulk FinFET is in, in the open circles. So if you look at the, uh, the uh, ESD design window requirement, the, the SOI is better uh, because the, the design window becomes smaller. And for, uh, but on the other hand, if you look at the robustness, the failure occurrence, the, the bulk is, uh, is much better. So here comes the, uh, the summarize of how we can realize effective FinFET uh, ESD solutions. So these are my, my suggestions. First, you can try to increase the size of ESD protection device. The pros are simple and effective because as I, as I said, the robustness is a function of the size of the device. The cons, you get a larger footprint, higher cost, Larger loading effect because the larger the, the size, the larger the capacitance, and therefore the larger the, the, uh, the core circuit degradation. And it, this approach cannot resolve the design window issue. So the second proposal is to optimize the ESD protection device structure. Pros, uh, there's no or little overhead on footprint and the loading effect. The comes, uh, this typically requires TK simulation and device physics, and my experience is that this may not be very effective. <laughs> this one is probably the most effective one. Uh, you can try to modify some step in fabrication process. So the pros, there's no overhead on footprint and maybe the most effective means comes, uh, you have to know the process and this is the most difficult part. You have to collaborate with and you have to get permission from the foundry, unless, unless you have your own foundry. Then you can modify the step, right? But most of the, most of the, uh, the chip suppliers, they use uh, uh, TSMC, they use Samsung, right? Uh, therefore, you have to, you have to convince the, uh, the foundries to, uh, to modify the step, and sometimes they will not allow you to do that. The last one is to try to come up with hybrid or novel devices 
other than just dialed, uh, ground DNA, KMRs, and the SCR. So we have been doing that for many years, uh, and we have some success in the past. Okay, so finally I'd like to just, uh, uh, from my perspective, uh, like to uh, just say a few words about the industry trends in the, in the ESD. Uh, designing effective uh, on-chip ESD protection solution for the sub-22 nanometer CMOS technology has been uh, very challenging. If you talk to uh, all these uh, wireless communication chip companies, like uh, Qualcomm, like Apple, like Samsung, they will tell you the same story. Uh, currently, uh, T TSMC, Samsung, and more recently, Intel. Intel has been used, has used to be a closed foundry for themselves, but recently Intel has opened up. Yeah. So, so you can, you can, uh, you can uh, have your chip fabricated at the Intel foundry. So these three foundries are, they can offer the sub 10, 10 nanometer thin vac node in the near future. But the lack of robust ESD protection solution is a main roadblock for this technology and the beyond. Uh, we did, I did say a few words about off-chip, right? So off-chip ESD protection solution, which can be realized in a mature process technology are being considered as a viable option to enhance the system level ESD robustness. See, the, the, the problem with the on-chip is that uh, you have to fabricate the on-chip protection solution uh, using the same technology as the core circuit. So if your core circuit is a 10 nanometer, then your ESD protection will have to be realized in the same 10, 10 nanometer. And that put a very large constraint on the design of ESD protection. The off-chip ESD it does not have that constraint. Uh, I did not have time to talk about this, but these are the two new um, areas, gallium nitride and the organic. And um, the ESD protection for these two uh, new um, technologies are also very important in the coming years. Uh, ESD EMI co-design. Uh, key to achieving robustness of the ESD uh, for automotive industry. So um, hopefully uh, you have um, uh, you have um, you have liked the uh, the talk. Uh, so uh, ESD is extremely important to the well-being of global semiconductor industry, and uh, developing EF of ESD protection solutions is often challenging and demanding. The outlook. The difficulty and the challenges of the design of ESD protection solution in low voltage smart technology were presented today. And uh, having the capability and know-how for designing effective and robust ESD protection solution will be increasingly critical and vital to future analog and digital ICs. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Would you take any questions? No, oh, sure, of course. Okay, we have time for maybe one, possibly two questions. Does anyone in the audience there? Yeah. You want one? You have a question? Okay. Oh, one over there. Okay, Bill Orner, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, you bring up some, some very concerning points, um, you know, particularly as we go from 16 to 10 to who knows what. <laughs> yes. It cannot be zero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then many IP providers you know, that are doing the I.O. designs use inconsistent uh, terminology to explain how well their IP is tested. Um, going beyond uh, HBM and human body model, machine model, there used to be another set of terminology uh -huh. as the quality of the ESD protection keeps going down. Is there anything going on to create new universal Terminology Are you referring to the standard, the ESD, uh, the ESD standards? Uh, as you probably know, the uh, human body model is the is a is a benchmark, and has been used for a long time in the industry. So typically, when a customer requires ESD protection, they will use the human body model uh, as the as the uh, the requirement. So this was, they will say, okay, I need a 500 volt or a 1,000 volt human body model protection. But, but in reality, uh, in today's technologies and, and, and the packaging, the human body model is actually out of dated. 
Yeah, because the chip gets so small, and there's no chance for the human finger to touch the, uh, the pin of the, uh, of, the, of the package, especially uh, many of the pins of the package now is underneath of the, uh, of the chip. Uh, so, so actually, uh, nowadays, the, uh, the most important ESD uh, uh, event is not human body model. It's, uh, it's the, uh, the CDM, the charge device model, and also the system level uh, model. But uh, so how do you take care of that? Well, typically, we can do a very good job on the human body model, and we will hope that this protection can also pass the CDM and, uh, and the system level. Now, what happens if they don't? If they don't, then you have to add some additional uh, structure on the chip to, to, to get them to, uh, to, to pass the, uh, the protection. Yeah. So that's the, the typical uh, way to, uh, to fulfill the requirement of the customer, is you do a good job on the human body model, and you hope for the best that this protection would also protect the CDM and, uh, and the, the system level. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Panasonic.